couple of weeks ago, on March 25th, a researcher from the University of Massachusetts conducted an interesting survey. He reached out to 20 eminent epidemiologists and public health experts, and he asked a simple question. He asked, how many Americans will die from this outbreak of the coronavirus? The average estimate he got back was 245,000 people. As it happens, that number matched almost exactly the projection from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, the group that has created the most influential model of the pandemic. As recently as yesterday, you heard some authorities cite those numbers effectively in public. Hundreds of thousands will die. Well, that estimate has changed dramatically. This morning, the IHME issued brand new numbers. Its researchers now project 60,000 deaths in this country by August 4th. That's one quarter of the original projection. Numbers for individual states have changed as well. In Virginia, for example, which is currently suffering under a lockdown until June, the model now predicts a total of 891 deaths statewide. Just a week ago, the IHME projected 3,073 deaths in Virginia. That's more than three times what they're now saying. At this point, we should not be surprised that the model got it wrong. The IHME's prediction of how many hospital beds we'd need turned out to be completely disconnected from reality. And that matters quite a bit, it turns out, because those numbers were the main justification for this lockdown. Remember our efforts to flatten the curve? They weren't crazy. There was a good reason for doing that. We didn't want our healthcare system to collapse under a flood of new coronavirus patients. And so far, it has not collapsed, but not because we prepared effectively. We didn't really. There were just far fewer people who needed inpatient medical treatment than we thought there would be. For example, the model predicted that on April 4th, New York would need 65,000 hospital beds. The actual number was 16,000. Now, you're hearing people now say that the spread between the prediction and the reality must be due to social distancing. But that is not true. Social distancing measures were factored into the model from the beginning. The prediction turned out to be four times larger than what actually happened. Social distancing didn't do that. Something else skewed the numbers. We don't know what it is. We should find out. At the same time, though, the IHME has been far more accurate on death totals. In some cases, they've been significantly overstated, but not by 400 percent. Pretty close in a lot of cases. Today, as we've told you, the IHME announced that about 60,000 Americans will die by the time the virus presumably recedes in the summer heat. That's an awful lot of people. But it's far from the largest death toll we will see this year. For perspective, we're going to read you now a series of numbers. Now, some people may be offended to hear this, but there's no reason to be. Accurate statistics are not offensive. They reflect reality, and reality should always be the baseline from which we make important decisions, even if we ourselves have made other predictions in the past, even if we're embarrassed to admit what we now know. We should do it anyway, because ego doesn't matter at a time like this. The truth matters. So here are a few numbers. As we said, an estimated 60,000 Americans will die from the coronavirus. According to the CDC, in 2018, 61,000 Americans died of the annual flu. That same year, more than 67,000 died from drug overdoses. Nearly 50,000 died from suicide. About 88,000 Americans died from alcohol abuse. 83,000 died from diabetes. More than 606,000 died from cancer. You could go on. But for now, let's look at two of those numbers, overdoses and suicides, both, by the way, disproportionately kill young people. Let's say the IHME death projections are too low for the sake of argument, and this would be the first time that's happened. But again, just for the sake of this exercise, let's assume the real number is twice as big. It's 120,000. That's how many Americans will die in this outbreak. If that's true, that would still be around as many people as die from overdoses and suicides, both of which our leaders essentially ignore. Deaths like those are not considered a government problem. Yet in the last several weeks, in order to protect ourselves from the Wuhan coronavirus, which is dangerous and scary, we have thrown an estimated 17 million people out of work. We have spent more than $2 trillion in borrowed money. And that's just the response so far. Now, we're not going to tell you that what our leaders have done in the last month is disproportionate. You can decide that for yourself. But it's definitely something to think about going forward, because, again, reality matters, even if it embarrasses us to admit it. Many of our politicians, though, don't seem to be thinking about it. In the face of improving numbers, in fact, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy announced that his state would, quote, if anything, tighten as opposed to loosen lockdown restrictions. Statements like that make you wonder what's really going on here. Is public health really the only consideration for these people? Maybe not. 
Here's Zeke Emanuel, who's not only an academic, but also a longtime political hack, explaining on MSNBC this morning that America must remain in its current state for a year and a half. Now, keep in mind, at almost the very moment that Zeke Emanuel said this, the IHME was revising its total death rate down to just 60,000. I do think we're going to turn to what we think of as normal, the sort of pre-COVID-19 uh, uh, situation, only with a vaccine or some very effective preventative that everyone can take. That is uh, 18 months away, and we need to keep wow. very, very clear about that. We're not getting that around the corner. You want to give everyone in this country the benefit of the doubt in the middle of a crisis. But honestly, you have to wonder what motivates people to say things like what you just heard. If you were sincerely trying to help the country, you'd be focused on effective medical treatments for this disease. A drug that saved even half of patients heading toward death would change the landscape immediately and forever. In a situation like this, science is our hope. So you'd think our media would be following every medical advance at least as closely as we followed the final four. But no, they're doing just the opposite. They're ignoring promising treatments in favor of promoting ever more oppressive social controls. Why are they doing that? In the case of the drug hydroxychloroquine, which doctors are giving right now to thousands of coronavirus patients, doctors who have, reporters rather, who have no grounding in science are telling us that it's unproven and risky, apparently in contrast to everything else we're doing. Fauci is saying those studies are not scientific, and chloroquine, a drug used to treat malaria and lupus, also carries cardiovascular risks. But the president continues to endorse the drug. President Trump has asked, what do you have to lose? Medical experts say, your life. What do you have to lose? Well, potentially you could lose your life. Experts say there isn't enough clinical data to show it's effective for coronavirus, and it has some serious side effects. They continue today to push uh, hydroxychloroquine in a way that is baffling to medical professionals. Gene Robinson, you write in the Washington Post, the one word uh, that proves why President Trump should not be president, what is it? Hydroxychloroquine. These people have no idea what they're talking about, and they don't care to learn. You know exactly what they're doing. They're launching partisan political attacks and pretending it's medical advice. That is always wrong. But right now, in the middle of a pandemic that is reckless and immoral, remember their names. 